Okay, folks, you're listening to a Shadow Channel podcast. My name is Lewis Hamlin. I'm joined today by Alex Montez, movie reviewer on YouTube. How you doing, Alex? I'm doing pretty good, man. How you doing for yourself? I'm, I'm great. I'm great. Yeah, it's pretty cold where I am. How about you? Because you're oh, from, from pre- California, aren't you? So. Yeah, I'm in California. Yeah, it's cold right here. Where I live right now, yesterday there was supposed to be a storm, so it was very cold and a lot of rain. And right now it's in the morning, so I'm wearing a lot of clothing all over me because it's very cold. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's that time before Christmas. Usually the cold weather you don't mind, but after Christmas, when <laughs> when everybody has to go back to work or college or school, wherever it is, no one can be bothered with it, right? So it's yeah, it's fun before Christmas, not so fun afterwards, but. Yeah, no. so we'll, right off the bat, we'll start by, because there's a lot of people that are going to be listening to this and maybe have seen you in my channel, because I think we box for box on the right-hand side of the screen, you know, like I have you in my drop-down menu of, of other channels that I'm associated with. Uh-huh. Um, so they might have seen you there, but for those of them who aren't aware of you, tell us a little bit about what you do on YouTube, man. All right, uh, well, basically what I do is I do movie reviews, uh, trailer reviews, TV shows, and occasionally um, skits from here and there. But my main thing, the core of my channel is movie reviews. And this idea, I wanted to do YouTube for a long time, actually, because um, I actually wanted to do not movie reviews, but video game walkthroughs, which is um, I saw a lot of guys doing. And I was like, oh, maybe I should do that. But then, like, there was so much needed for that setup that I was like, you know what? Forget that. So then later on, like I think around 2013, I saw a lot of more movie reviewers. And because of my love for movies, I was like, you know what? These guys are having fun talking about movies. So I'm like, why don't I do that as well? So then I got a camera. I had to get an editing system, editing program for that. And then once I started, I could not get tired of it. So basically what I do is just movie reviews. Yeah, I mean, it's that's what they say, right? They say you should always do the thing that you love doing. If you're not enjoying it, you shouldn't do it. You know, you watch those videos where the the big YouTuber, or whatever, they'll tell you all the stuff. You know, the five golden rules of of having fun and having success on YouTube is, and one of them is always do what you love. And uh, I can see that from your videos. When I watch your videos, you're definitely doing what you love, and it's completely true uh, that you never get tired of doing what you love. That's the best thing about it, right? Yeah, the only the only time I got tired of it was um last year when I was do uh the Hobbit the Desolation of Smaug was coming out here, um I was doing um each of the Lord of the Rings movie reviews so I did all three Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, and I remember I was watching it every I watched them every day and then I did <laughs> edited them and at a point I was like oh my god this is getting like such a pain in the butt and then the next you know the Godzilla trailer came out so I had to edit that so there was just like at that period of time it, I got bothered by it like I was like not having as much fun but that was the only time point yeah it's it's like a labor of love right I mean it, it feels like work but it's not the same as like if you were at a job I mean it's hard and you get you get bored of it but even the stuff you get bored of or the stuff that you find difficult or, or, you know, whatever, it's still kind of fun in a, it's almost like working out, you know, it's almost like going to the gym. Like it feels like something you don't necessarily want to do, but you do it anyway. Cause you, you like what the end result is like the process of releasing oh, the video oh. and the response, you know? Yeah, man, absolutely. And that's what I feel the same way in the gym. <laughs> And so, I mean, how did you get started on YouTube? Because everyone has their own their own story. I mean, who were your influences when you first started out? You said you initially wanted to do game reviews. In so far as uh, reviewing films is concerned, you wanted to do game walkthroughs, pardon me. Uh, and so far as reviewing films is concerned, uh, who were your major influences starting up? How did you model your initial style on? Because everybody did that to begin with, right? Yeah, like uh, when I watched Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, I hated that movie. So I wanted to go online to see if anyone else hated it. So I never really um, saw movie reviewers that much. You know, I think I only saw like one movie reviewer and that was it. And um, so I was going online. Then I see uh, Jeremy Johns. Jeremy Johns was the guy who inspired me the most the first time. And then I saw these other channels. I saw Schmoes No, I saw The Flip Pick, and then I saw Chris Stuckman. And all those four guys were the ones who inspired me the most. And the one that I took my style off from mostly was Jeremy Johns because he was like the first one. He was the main guy that I saw. Exactly. I mean, Jeremy Jans, it's, he has even influenced my delivery. When I first started on YouTube, you know, I don't know what your early videos were like, but everyone's early videos seems to be the same. You talk like really quietly 
and you're like, yeah, I just want to review this film just now because it's you don't have that confidence. You're not used to doing it yet, you know. I don't know if you had that where your early videos you're like almost whispering and you don't like move your body when you're talking. You don't have any like physical presence, you know, like almost like a singer on a stage. And Jeremy Jans has a lot of like physical presence in the way that he talks. He moves his hands a lot and he's very animated. And yeah. I even took some influence from Jeremy Jans uh, in in my delivery, made it more energetic and tried to make it more energetic anyway. I mean, he's a really influential guy. He really is. Yeah, in my earlier videos, I hate them because it's so boring. Like some of them, like I'm looking right here, are four minutes long. You can't even get past a minute. It is just so bad. It's it, like I'm just so boring. It's not interesting. Mm. The moment that I changed, you know, I was like, okay, we need to change. Was my painting game movie review? That was the first review where I was like, you know what? I'm actually really proud of that because I was actually energetic. I changed my style. I was actually talking a little bit more louder than before. And I changed my intro as well. So that was the first review. I was like, you know what? This is time for a change. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you obviously love movies. Uh, that's apparent from both what you do. And we were talking a couple of weeks ago in the run up to doing this show. And uh, you're one of those guys that you can just talk about movies all day, every day. I have a few friends that are like you and it's very reminiscent, you know, uh, and it's a huge passion of yours. Who are your favorite directors? So like if you're going to sit down in the movie theater or the cinemas uh, and see a film in terms of, you know, you thinking this is going to be bad or this is going to be good, who makes you uh, the least worried when you sit down? Who, who constantly delivers good uh, stuff to the screen? Definitely Christopher Nolan and Quentin Tarantino and Steven mm -hmm. Spielberg. Those are the main three guys. Whenever I see a movie, I'm like, you know what? I, you know, you still have that optimistic side in you, but you're just like, you know what? I still have the feeling this is going to be a really good movie. Those are the three main guys because they constantly, like Christopher Nolan, all of his movies, there's not, in my opinion, not a single bad one. There may be one that's like, mm, not as good, but even for that, his worst film is still good which is insomnia which everyone says and it's true but it's not that it was bad it's just that compared to his other films yeah. it's not as great but on its own it's still really good so christopher nolan has not made a single bad movie for me and then steven spielberg it's steven spielberg you know there's like that not that much to say and quentin tarantino has delivered day in and day out constantly i love almost like every single one of his movies exactly i mean it's ironic that i that i that i mentioned this point uh, about failure and success because i mean your name's alexander and alexander the great there was something famous written about him where he he died when he was 32 before he took over the world and i don't know if you saw that movie alexander and at the end ptolemy says you know he he failed to do this but his failures towered over other people's successes and that's kind of what it's like with spielberg and some of these other directors like they can make a bad film but their bad films uh by their standards are still better than some other people's good films and that's the weirdest thing you know yeah because you know what every great director there's always going to come a bad one you know like it's like inevitable so if the bad one comes then oh well but then like some of their bad ones like how you said they're not even that bad which shows how great of directors they are exactly yeah i mean in terms of uh, in terms of doing uh, reviews on youtube you're seeing your style changed and it's definitely been working from what i can see because you hit 100 subscribers back in the spring which for folks like me and you is a big deal you know because we we can exist in the in the peripheries of youtube and that's where i think uh, the underground maybe you could call it um <laughs> where you see these channels coming up and down and i've checked my my video uh, my channel stats on uh, vid stats before and i'm uh -huh. always quite proud because whenever i check uh, who the guys immediately in front and immediately behind me on the like million channel leaderboard that, of all the people that have channels on YouTube. It'll mm -hmm. be like one guy with a 13 second troll video of him like filming his TV with his camera phone. And I'm like, nah, I'm doing okay. Uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> it feels bad, but I know that guy doesn't care either. So I'm like, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> and, uh, you get 100 <clears throat> subscribers and that's a big deal for, for you. Um, you know, have you noticed what what are the things that you've noticed most about what's changed on the channel? Do you notice that the average viewing figures? This might be a question that will be most well received by other people that are listening to this that have YouTube channels like me and you who are who are looking to become better at what they're doing and enjoy it more and make it you know better for the audience. What what changes have you noticed most since the spring when you hit 100 subscribers in terms of views and reception, comments, likes, dislikes, you know? Well, the fan interaction changes the most because I always love interacting with 
my subscribers and that's like because like they're fans of movies too so you get to interact with them you know and like for example like um let's say i make a discussion video and then someone comes backs it up and says well here's my opinion then i'm like you know what man that's a great opinion as well so the fan interaction has changed the most i get a lot more fan interaction and that's the thing that i noticed and and my views essentially increased as well you know the likes went up more too and i feel like if i i have the to me, I have a better, I have uh, much more confidence to upload my video because then I have like a lot more supporters who like, like they'll say, and like they give their honest opinion. They say, hmm, to me, that video wasn't as good as your other previous, but it was still good. And I'm like, okay, man, thanks. I'll help improve, that'll help improve my next videos. So definitely the fan interaction and better confidence for me. Exactly. I mean, that tends to be the main problem when you're a small channel. It's it almost goes without saying, but because you're a small channel, the amount of uh, rating or reaction that you get from each video in terms of likes or dislikes or comments, the hardest part is getting to the point where you have enough of a reaction from the people that are listening. Like that's why you know it's so important to ask people to comment and like and dislike because it's almost like you you go blind. You know, you don't know whether what you're making is mm-hmm. good or bad because you don't get any response or you don't yeah. get enough of a response. And yeah, that that's definitely the biggest milestone that I think from where I'm sitting, you know, it seems to be uh, that I'm going to pass in the future is when you get to that certain tipping point, you get way more information about uh, how you're doing. And that allows you, like you were saying, to improve what you're making. But for you, I mean, you were talking recently about... Um, uh, uh, getting a new camera, for example. I mean, are you excited about that? What, what are you looking to do with that new camera? Well, the main reason why I want to get a new camera is because I wanted to make short films and also, too, to increase the quality of my videos. And uh, so, like, for a long time, I've just looked at my videos. I'm like, you know what? These could be better. These could be better. But for right now, it's fine. But then it's like going to that point where, like, you know what? I just I, – even though it's good for now – I still wanted it to be better. So I want to get a new camera, not just for that, but also to make short films. Because um, earlier this year, there was a film festival that came around to my town. And I wanted to show my short film there, but I didn't have the right camera and the right setup to do that. So I couldn't do it. So, And I have like written like a bunch of scripts for short films that I want to do in the future. I think I've written five you know i've like every day in school like i'm just like thinking hmm what if this happens in my film these characters interact like this like i'm always thinking like that and so that's the biggest reason why i want to buy a new camera so i could film my short films yeah i mean i've i study um the audiovisual technology which includes filmmaking and that's by far the most difficult subject for me uh, to learn but from what i've um, heard from other people that make short films for example my friend Adam Boris who I think should be coming on around Christmas or New Year uh, he mm-hmm. makes short films and it's weird I heard Tarantino say once that before you make a film it's almost like you have to write a book and then you take the script from the book after you've written it it's really weird but even short firm films are really difficult to make and um, they are though from what I've heard really satisfying when you eventually get them done so I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that kind of content on your channel for real yeah 100% yeah because the main thing that I want to do is become a director when I grow up you know I've been looking at a bunch of schools in LA to go to so to learn about filmmaking and all that and what I want to do is I want to get an experience you know like okay let's see like when I go to school like I'll be like not as an expert I'll be like oh I know everything but I'll be like okay I know the basics of like directing a movie and what needs we need to tell the actors and how the camera stuff's got to go and the lighting so I want to get the basic you know you know the understand what it takes to make a movie yeah, absolutely. It's a really exciting process and it's it can take a lot out of you, but it's also really rewarding in the end of it as well. But let's talk like up the gear a little bit. We could talk about next year because I just mentioned that I'm going to have my friend Adam Boris on either this Christmas or in the new year. 2015 is going to be a massive year for movies. What are you most looking forward to sitting down and watching? I mean, oh. There are a few obvious choices, but... Yeah, um, well, the uh, for 2015, like the biggest one, obviously, everyone would say was is Avengers Age of Ultron. Because it's like, you know what, like, I was so excited for the Avengers to come out. Like, I remember when they first announced it, people didn't know what the Avengers were. And then when it came out, everyone knows about the Avengers. So definitely Age of Ultron is one of them. And, um, like, I think the next biggest one for me would uh, probably be the James Bond 
Spectre. I, I I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's basically based off of an old James Bond movie and it's called Spectre. Yeah, Spectre. And that's the one of the ones that I'm looking forward to the most. And the thing is, there's like there's so much movies coming out in 2015 that it's almost like I don't know if I can bear that, you know, because it's so much. I don't know if I'll be able to handle it all. Because as a film goer, this is a great time to be a film lover because there's so much mm-hmm. movies and so many coming that you're gonna like basically die because there's so much movies and so much entertainment for you to go to. And that's the thing that I'm really looking forward to the most in 2015. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I didn't know about Spectre. Yeah, I think Spectre is one of Ian Fleming's original uh, stories that he wrote about James Bond 007 uh, back in the 50s, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Ian Fleming's been – it is Ian Fleming, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, Ian I think Fleming's that's been dead for 50 years. I mean, he – Wow. Yeah, I mean, th- those movies, they make an unbelievable amount of money. To be fair, I still haven't seen Skyfall. Wow, you should see Skyfall. Oh, I know. You know, a lot, a lot of people say it's overrated, but you know what? It's just like – in 2012, everything was overrated. I swear, like the Avengers was overrated, the Dark Knight Rises was overrated, all the big movies were overrated. So that's what people always say. But trust me, Skyfall is a great movie. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm looking forward. I mean, the Star Wars trailer just came out oh. a couple of weeks ago, and that had, I think, overwhelmingly good reception. I've heard a few people who who criticized it, and to be honest, from the way from the way I'm sitting or the place I'm sitting, it's looking like it's going to be a hell of a lot better than the prequels. Hell yeah. Because, well, yeah, because it's J.J. Abrams and he's a fan of Star Wars. So as a fan, you get to look back and say, okay, I didn't like those prequels. So I'm going to do my version of like make it more better and go back and harken back to the original Star Wars movies, which this trailer seems to be doing. And what I like that is that this trailer didn't focus on Luke, Han, or Leia, or Chewbacca. It focused on the new people. It's like saying, yeah, these guys, they're coming soon, but let us show you the new generation of Star Wars. And that's what I really liked about the trailer, that it was able to show its new stars and say, hey, get ready for these guys because these guys are going to be very important as well. Mm, Absolutely. I mean, in terms of the trailer, there was a question that I wanted to ask you um, about movie going and and watching trailers in cinemas uh, and the impact that those trailers have on the audiences that watch them and how that can be sometimes positive and sometimes negative. Um, You, you have been quite outspoken about this. What what do you reckon? You've kind of, kind of got a view on the impact of trailers, right? Yeah, because trailers, like there was like a poll on Google that were saying that trailers are the biggest things that impact an audience um, perception of a movie which is also could be a good thing and a bad thing. For example, um, a bad thing could be as, um, let's say there's a terrible trailer before a really good movie. For example, like this year, Edge of Tomorrow that starred Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt, it had mm. terrible, terrible trailers. Just go watch the trailers and you'll be like, I don't even, I'm not even sure if I want to watch the movie. But when you watch the movie, it's so great. And it's one of the most original movies that I've seen in a long time. And it's one of Tom Cruise's best performances that he's given in a long time. So then, like, you watch and you're like, wow, this movie's awesome. And then you're like, oh, man, why did the, why are the trailers so bad? And it didn't make as much money as it should have. It made enough to call it a success, quote unquote, but it still should have made a lot more money. And then when it, and then, like, the thing about trailers nowadays is that, they seem to give away too much. And one of the biggest examples of that is The Amazing Spider-Man 2. You know, like people, there's a lot of people who hate the movie. I liked it. There's a lot of problems with it. But the thing that I noticed um, in the first trailer was that it showed a lot. Like honestly, like if you watch like just the first trailer of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, you get like the basis of how the movie is going to start and end. Like there's so much. Like they show all of their Easter eggs. They show all of the big fights. And then – Spoiler alert for the Amazing Spider-Man Two. Do you mind? This oh, is I like don't a mind quick at all. One. This is the channel of spoiler alerts. Uh, no, no <laughs> right. go right ahead. Go right ahead. And um, what happens is that in the trailer you see Spider-Man fighting Rhino, and like that's the end shot of the trailer. And you're like, oh, okay, so there's gonna be this big fight between Spider-Man and the Rhino. But then when you watch the movie, there's no fight. That the scene in the trailer, that's their quote-unquote fight. It's just a quick. View and it's like you just spoiled the ending of the yeah. Amazing Spider-Man Two, and like they show all these Easter eggs with Doctor Octopus and then the Vulture, and then all these scenes that like the Green Goblin fight with him. Like there's so much mm. added to that, and that if you just watch two trailers, you get like g- a good ten minutes of the Amazing Spider-Man Two. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's also when they do that, it kind of misrepresents what the film's going to be about. You know, like if you think the fight scene is going to be really long, and they make it out to be really really long, and then you watch it, and it's basically what you saw in the trailer in terms of its length. That's kind of dishonest, and you know, it doesn't really represent the movie well. I did think that the first Amazing Spider-Man that came out uh, 2012, I think, wasn't mm-hmm. it? Um, I thought that was a lot better than the ones with Tobey Maguire. I know that they were Spider-Man, and that's the Amazing Spider-Man, but I did I preferred the way that those that the the first Amazing Spider-Man was like a, it felt more like a real movie if that makes any sense it was less cheesy yeah the thing that was the thing about the Sam Raimi's I think a lot of people say and it's true he's trying to hark it back at that 1960s Spider-Man with his movies but yeah like as time went on you're like yeah this is pretty cheesy and for me I I like the first two uh, Tobey Maguire Spider-Mans and I like the Amazing Spider-Man because it was more of like the comic book Spider-Man you know harking back to that and it was more True to the comics, and that's what I really like about the first Amazing Spider-Man. But even with the, and the thing that I noticed with all the Spider-Man movies is that there's not been a Spider-Man movie where I'm like, you know what, I love that, I want to watch it day in and day out. There hasn't been a Spider-Man movie for that. And if you heard about the Sony hacks, they're no. oh wait, <clears throat> the one where they hacked their CEOs, yeah, and they got their emails, <clears throat> yeah. And when you can see the emails that um Sony was trying to have with Marvel Studios, you know, they have the Avengers, Guardians of the Galaxy. They were trying to have like make a deal where they have Spider Man in their universe, but it was essentially the deal was cut off because of you know the idea of control. Like, no, we want Spider Man to do this. Like, no, it would be good if Spider Man doesn't do this. And like, it was just a banter back and forth, so they couldn't work it out. And then you hear like there's so much like going on with um, Spider Man franchise in Sony that they don't even know what to do. Like right now, the Amazing Spider-Man three is put on hold indefinitely. We don't know what's going to come out. I haven't the seen only- the second one. How was it received? The second one, I still haven't seen it. Critically, it was mixed, but from the audience, it was mixed. Mixed. There's a lot of people who hate the movie, uh, and but there and there's a lot of people who like the movie. And there's a small majority of people who um, love the movie. Like a couple of my friends love the movie, but for me, I liked it because the thing is that when you watch it. You understand it has a lot of problems, but then once you get out of it, you're like, you know what? That was enjoyable. You know, there's a lot of flaws, but I still enjoyed it. But you – like whenever come, someone comes up to me and says, hey, do I hate the Amazing Spider-Man 2 and this is why? I cannot argue with them. I'm like, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I agree with you, yeah. There's so much wrong with that movie. I understand why you hate it. And then Sony just like really needs to like get a um, – because what I've noticed from their emails is that – they lack control. They lack a leader, like a leader chief officer who's like, you know what? Okay, guys, calm down. This is what we're going to do and this is how it's going to happen. Like for example, um, Marvel Studios has Kevin Feige who is like, okay, guys, he's like the main guy, the leader. He's like, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how it's going to happen. He's like, he has total control, but he's not like a dictator. He just likes – he's like keeps everything balanced. And the same thing is happening over there in Warner Brothers DC – Kevin Osujihara, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's doing the same thing now because if you notice for Suicide Squad, the next DC movie, it has an incredible cast. It has Will Smith, Tom Hardy, Marco Rarby, and Jared Leto. Like, there's a lot of there's a big great cast for that. So he's obviously getting the hang of things over there at Warner Brothers and Sony. They need that because they lack total control. Because if you look at the emails, they were looking like to see if they could bring um, the music composer James Horner. To direct the movie, I think, mm. and um, and he was talking about like how he when he was doing the score, like they, there was lack of direction. He was like, "This is just so bad." Like, and he said that the studio does not have faith in their director, Mark Webb, and I was like, "Ah, oh, we don't have faith in that guy." And he was saying like how the producers, what they were doing is that they were giving their intake, like everyone from Sony was just giving their intake, saying, "Oh, have more action, just have more this and that." Yeah, and they, it's like designed they did, by committee. That's always the worst thing. <clears throat> yeah, they didn't give a Mark Webb, who's the director, enough control to give his true vision. Like I felt like they made Spider Man. I was like, okay. This was good. Let's see if he could prove his directing skills in the second one. But it just felt like when – and here's the thing you're going to notice when you watch um, Macy Spider-Man 2. It feels like a studio film because it's just so much like um, advertising the movie. and There's just so much action and bloatedness in that. It's like you could tell like Mark Webb didn't get the chance to do what he wanted to do because mm. they were so focused on 
creating a Amazing Spider-Man universe that they lost sight of making a good movie. So, and Sony, that's what they need the most. They need a leader to say, hey, enough of this. Let's do this in this direction. Mm. And that's the thing that Sony needs big time right now. Yeah, they need like they need one sort of unified vision behind the film. Those are those are usually the best films, you know. When you have everything parceled off to like an executive here or like a focus group here, that's how you make terrible films, and that's just a perfect recipe for making awful films. Yeah. And um, now, uh, you know, Christmas is a time of year where people have some quite on the face of it, weird choices uh, in the kind of films that they find to be classics or they think are classics. So <laughs> the classic one is uh, Die Hard. You know, uh, I saw a meme the other day. It was uh, there, there are people uh, who think that Die Hard is a Christmas movie. And there are people who are wrong. You know, like uh, it's, it's, it is it is viewed as a seminal Christmas movie. It's just a great Christmas movie. And that's quite unusual because it's a kind of fairly dark... Uh, action movie. Yeah, but, it, you know, <laughs> for me, yeah, it's a Christmas movie for sure. Hundred percent, same. Yeah, because yeah, I loved it, you know, and um, definitely when Christmas comes around, that's the first movie we're gonna be watching. And um, for me, I have um, I haven't watched any of like the Christmas, like true Christmas classics that everyone's been saying. And this year, I plan on doing that, watching a lot of Christmas classics. Like for example, I plan on watching Die Hard, Home Alone. And um, some of the other uh, Christmas movies, like I heard, uh, a, I, f- I think this is the title of the movie, A Christmas Story. I forgot what it is. Christmas Story. That's what I plan on watching. So I plan on watching all the classic movies that people have been saying that's good yeah, for Christmas. Yeah, Miracle on 34th Street, Elf. Um, oh, I love Elf. <laughs> Elf's great. Yeah, we have those t-shirts in the supermarket near where my house is, you know, like <laughs> Santa. I know him. <laughs> uh, but I mean, for me, it's, it's an unusual, for me, films, it's kind of like wherever, whatever you're in the mood for, whenever you're in the mood for it. I mean, Scream, we were talking about Scream a couple of weeks ago yeah. uh, by Wes Craven, I think released in 96. Uh-huh. Scream's a fascinating movie. I mean, are you as big a lover of that franchise as I am? I mean, as I know, I yeah, am. I love Scream. Not as well for you. You love all of them, right? Uh, more or less, yeah. The original, though, uh, above all the others. I mean, yeah, that's the thing for foremost. me. Like, I'll, like for me, the first one's awesome. The second one, it's okay. The third one, once the third one hit, I was like, yeah, this is starting to become a parody of itself. Ultimately, was Scream was trying to parody off of horror films. Scream yes. was becoming that franchise. Exactly. So, so I was like, yeah, this is yeah, it's not as good as the first one or the fir- mm. or the second one. But I mean, Wes Craven's done really well because when it came to Nightmare on Elm Street, he made like ten of them, you know. So <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, know, and and I don't know if maybe Wes Craven was doing that ironically, like he was like, this is a film about the nature of movies and sequels and stuff, and so I myself, I'm going to make a bunch of these films, not only just to make money, but to be really ironic about that, you know, like Scream itself has a bunch of sequels that are all kind of a little bit ah, they're okay you know i mean i haven't seen i have seen scream 4 actually uh and it's that's a forgettable movie when you watch that there's not really you don't come away from it thinking that was amazing you know it's it's kind of it's average you know? i barely remember scream 4 that's yeah. how forgettable it is and the same thing is for scream 3 like as soon as like the third one hit it was just like eh whatever but i still love this um the first one i have it on blu-ray i i I, it's funny when i first watched scream i was very little i was like younger than uh 10 years old and i started watching it and i loved it and i was like am i gonna become a killer because i love it because i'm so young but no that that didn't happen it's just like i love the movie and i still to this day i love it and i watched it recently and i was like you know what this movie is so smart and so clever that it's like this really truly parodies like other slasher horror films, and I like the whole analogy. Like, oh, this you can't. You're if you're a virgin, then you cannot die in a horror film. Yeah, <laughs> those rules make me laugh. Yeah, it's weird because it's almost a movie that is a review. Because you do movie reviews, it, you could look at it as almost a movie that reviews movies. It, it kind of looks at the nature of what movies are, particularly horror movies. And it, I mean, the second one where they have that discussion about why sequels are uh, inferior films. And the second one was itself slightly less good than the first film. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that, there's so much irony in those films. That was like one of my favorite scenes from the second one. Yeah, and I don't know if Wes Craven was trying to do it ironically, but to me, 
I feel like that like ruins your credibility then if you're trying yeah. to do that ironically. So I don't know, but to me, I felt like maybe he was – to me, maybe he was running out. He was trying to milk it and, and if he was trying to do that on purpose, then OK. He didn't, <laughs> he didn't, he didn't really need to do that. Yeah, okay. but, but hey, um, still, I watched them, you know. There you go. Yeah, and finally, this is the last question I'm kind of going to ask you before we wrap up. For the sake of my friend Mike Miller, and I, we discussed this a few weeks ago as well. Um, and, and here's the question. I don't have a drum roll, but wait for it. <laughs> so Captain America the First Avenger <laughs> or Captain America the Winter Soldier, which is better? Which is the better movie? I say I see the first Avenger. You, I think, have the opposite opinion. But let's discuss that for a few minutes before we wrap up, because my friend Mike, he'll he'll get a kick out of it, and maybe maybe it will confirm his own point of view. Most likely will. Well, you um, why don't you take the seat? Why do you think the first Avenger is better? Well, I think the first Avenger is better because the the theme of the film, the themes within the film are more original than the second film. To me, the second film felt a lot like the Avengers, the, you know, the, the, the Avengers ensemble uh-huh. that came out in 2012. It was these big set piece action scenes. And see, don't get me wrong. I love the second film. I think it's a great film. But when I compare the two, I prefer the first one because you have that kind of that Nazi, you know, kind of creepiness. And it's set in the 40s, but there are people with laser guns, uh, <laughs> you know. And uh, also, it's because it's like that origin story, you know, it's, it's that they give you the background of how he becomes Captain America. Whereas the second one, it starts out and he's just jogging. And he runs into uh, the guy. I can't remember the guy's name. The guy that has his character has like wings. Uh huh. Oh, Falcon. Crap. Yeah, the Falcon. And that's how that 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 uh that film begins. Whereas the first one, it begins with guys digging in the ice, and they find him, you know, frozen in a glacier. And then it jumps back to the forties, and he's this scrawny guy that can't get into the army. And it runs through all that. But also, the first film has um has oh, what's her name? I've forgotten her bloody name. Uh oh, God, she's in Game of Thrones. I've forgotten her name. Natalie Dormer. Dormer. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Natalie Dormer, and it has the other chick that was in a miniseries, a BBC miniseries a couple of years ago called Pillars of the Earth uh-huh. about people building a cathedral in the Middle Ages, and it was like a drama. Mm. It was really interesting. It was, you know, it was it was a really uh, cool miniseries, about three episodes long. And those uh, two were in that film, so that's an added plus because, you know, having those two on the same screen is just eye candy for me. Um, <laughs> but also, yeah, I mean, it's you, you've got... um. You've got a whole host of fantastic actors in the first film. Same with the second film, but I felt that the story of the first film was more – it kind of grabbed you more and it felt a little bit more original. But uh, what do you think? What do you reckon about the second one? Well, I understand your points. But for me, the reason why the second one is superior is because in the first one, it was basically like a saying like – which is not a bad thing because it was said in the 1940s. It was like, yeah, America's good. F yeah. America's – everything's all good. We're mm-hmm. awesome. And then it, with the soldier shows – Oh, we're not so good. We're actually pretty shady. And that's what I really liked. It was a polit- it was like a 1970s political thriller. It showed like, you know, like us America, we can be shady. The government like – and there was this great line that um, Steve Rogers said in the second one where he's like – we're like um, – like Nick Fury is saying like we're going to have all these big ships and he's like – and we're going to call it freedom. And then Steve Rogers is like, yeah, by putting a gun to everyone's head and calling it freedom. And then I really like the themes that the Winter Soldier played on, and like and showing that um, how shady us can we can be, and like how our freedom is not necessarily what we think it is. And there was like so many recurring themes, and um, and when you call it like an Avengers assemble piece, I think that's one of the things that elevated Captain America from the from the first Avenger, like. To me, it felt like a lot more smarter. It felt more clever. It was like definitely had much more deeper. And what I liked it, it was like a more grittier tone than the first one. And um, essentially, I just like how it talked back on like the um, the government and all the political themes around it. And that's why I think it's a, a better movie. And like from the compared to the first one, this is just the thing. Like the fight scenes, they're amazing. Like the Winter Soldier fight scenes are like some of the best, and mm. they even go against like the Avengers action scenes because they're really well done, well choreographed, and um, and all around the acting and the story, which for me was more deeper. But I could understand why you prefer the first Avenger. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think it's Bucky. 
Mm-hmm. It's Bucky's character. His character is great in the second one as well as in the first one. And the fight scenes in the second one, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the one where they're on the uh, the overpass on the road. Oh yeah, and, uh, yeah. And he's and I like the scene with Nick Fury's car where his car. Like we're going to try and find out how many gadgets his car has, and it takes like ten minutes to destroy Nick Fury's car. You know, yeah, Nick Fury, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, that was definitely that was definitely really cool and. It's. I mean, they both are fantastic films, but for the sake of my friend Mike, I think he would have never forgiven me if I hadn't asked you about that. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what? Everyone has an opinion. You know, like some people, they think the first Avenger is pretty slow. Like they, mm, they don't like it's it. A long it's long film. Like they say that compared to the other Marvel films, it's not as long. But some people say, oh, it's slow. And they, some people say it's the least – their least favorite in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah. But uh, for me, I really liked the first Avenger, but then the Winter Soldier just elevated everything because I watched it recently. And there's just so much depth to that and the way it was constructed and edited, it's like it's one of the best movies of the year without mm-hmm. a doubt. It's just so well done because not – and that's the thing that I noticed for like, like the comic book movies. You know, they've – elevated themselves to greater films because before the Dark Knight trilogy, comic book films, they were just like ah, run of the mill blockbuster movies. But then once mm-hmm. the Dark Knight Christopher Nolan took a hold of Batman, you were like, oh, these could yeah. actually be great movies. And the same these thing was be for heavy hitters yeah, in the box office. Yeah, it was the same thing for X Men, the first X Men. And compare comic book movies to like ten years ago, they're not the same thing. They're totally different. Mm, Fantastic like, Four. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Van Helsing was a good film, but that was more like graphic novel based. Uh the you know the original Van Helsing from two thousand four? Yeah. That had Kate Beckinsdale and, and, and everyone and loads of other people in it. Um that was a good film because I liked the theme again and I liked the cinematography, you know, it was all kind of dark blue colors and it, and it felt like 19th century Transylvania it was just, they really brought that to life. The underworld films are good films. Well, at least the first one is, uh, those, th- there was a lot of, that's when vampires were cool. Remember that? Oh yeah. Uh, for me, the, well, I'm glad you like Van Helsing. I didn't like it. Um, <laughs> um, for Underworld, yeah, the first – for me, I love the first two actually. The first two are, in my opinion, really yeah. good. But the first one is definitely the best one. And um, like, I, like I love the way they portrayed the vampires and the werewolves. The werewolves especially. I loved how they were. They were just so big and so ruthless and like they, they were like scary compared to the Twilight where they yeah. looked like puppies. Exactly, and, and there was more theory behind it. Like there was more depth to the background story about how vampires exist and how yeah. werewolves exist. Whereas in like the Twilight movies, I still think one of the best vampire films uh, ever released was Interview with the Vampire because it deals with the themes of immortality. It says, you know, like if you were immortal, you would hate your life. You know, yeah. Um, and that came out in '94. I mean, that's a good film if you want like a dry. Or not a dry film, but if you want a film that has like some deeper emotional stuff in it, which Underworld doesn't have as much. Uh, but it's, I mean, that film alone, Interview with a Vampire, that's better than anything that was ever produced from the the Twilight franchise. I mean, on its um, own. A piece of shit is better than uh, Twilight, for sure. Yeah, okay? exactly. Twilight is yeah. bad. And the thing that I love about Underworld was the whole mythology around it. The way they set up the world and like mm. the covenant in the underworld series it, it led up to interesting stories and unfortunately the third and fourth one they weren't as good exactly and it's not even that it's like just that it's a chick flick or anything no i mean if you look at if you look at the transformers movies and compare oh, them to something like God. the avengers they're they're just as bad and they're aimed just at little boys i mean there's no difference they're just as awful you know yeah uh, and that's the thing that I, Booth, you know? yeah and that was the thing like you know this year transformers age of extinction came out and um, I remember when the trailers came out and when I well, – before the trailers came out, when I heard, oh, Michael Bay's coming back, I'm like, oh my god. Are you serious? He's coming to come back? But then I heard Mark Wahlberg was coming in. For those of you guys who don't know, I'll go gay for Mark Wahlberg. He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's my he's my yeah. idol. <laughs> Mark. I love Marky Mark you know, and the Funky Bunch. Um, so when I heard he was going to be in, I was like, you know what? That's really cool. This could, he could be like that action hero that the first three Transformers didn't have. He could yeah. actually be that good actor who leads the movie. And um, and then when you see it, and when you saw the trailers, I was like, wow, this actually looks pretty good. But then I was like, you know what? That was the same thing for the other Transformers movies. The trailers were really awesome. 
Because Michael Bay can construct a badass trailer. Mm-hmm. Like if you watch, um, have you seen Pain and Gain? Uh, I haven't seen Pain and Gain. You mentioned it earlier. Give us a quick rundown about what that's about, just for me. Basically, we it's, based, it's based on a true story that happened back in the 1990s in Miami. What happens is that the, um, these uh, three bodybuilders they kidnap this guy who um, who uh, like they he. The a deal went with them was one of them the main guy who Mark Wahlberg betrayed was Daniel Lugo. He um him and this guy, he they were trying to make a deal but things didn't go out well. So what happens is that he gets a couple of his friends, um, and they're bodybuilders and they get him and they torture him for like a couple of days to get money from him and they essentially try to kill him, but it fails, and so then they like live on their rich life and then next you know it, um. The guy and it was crazy about the story. Like if you go go read it, like you put on um, pain and gain, true story, you're gonna see that the story is crazy. Like the real story itself, because Michael Bay in the movie he um, essentially made it his own. Like he tried to make Bad Boys, but with bodybuilders. Yeah, I mean he's been trying to remake Bad Boys for 20 years. That's kind of his thing. But, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, but if you watch, like, if you read the actual story, it's crazy. Like the police officers didn't even believe the victim. They're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. They thought he was just yeah. drunk because what they did was before they put him in a car and they crashed his car so he could blow up. But what they did is that they put alcohol in his system, so that way when he crashes, they see, oh, he was drunk. And it was yeah. crazy too is that some of the plants that they did, they worked out. But then you see like those three guys, like all the bodybuilders, the guys who try to, you know, create these plants, they're dumb as fuck. But yet, yeah. but yet these things are working like and they're messing up everything. And it's just, it just gets, it goes out of hand. And it basically, Pain and Gain is the true definition. The movie is the true definition of Michael Bay. You just yeah. see saturated colors, big breasted women, you know, yeah, <laughs> and body. It gives you everything you want, right? Yeah, <laughs> pretty well, much. Well, I mean, this has been an awesome conversation, man. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I've definitely, I mean, if you want to come on again at any point in the future, uh, I'm going to try next time to do a Google Hangouts thing. So that way we can have multiple people on. And it's it's just been awesome talking to you, man. Man, yeah, it's been great to finally talk to you. Like, remember last year when you and me first started talking, I was like, mm-hmm. when I saw you do, do podcasts, I was like, you know what? This would be really cool if we would do it later on in the future. So it's been really awesome to finally talk to you, man. Absolutely, man. And and come next year, come next summer when uh, the uh, a lot of the blockbuster movies are coming out, the big summer hits, um, that we might have you on again uh, and we could talk about, you could tell us uh, what to go see, you know, <laughs> what you reckon we should go see, what we should maybe give a miss until it comes out on DVD or Blu-ray uh, because that's, that's a big time of year where there's a lot of good films and people have like a finite amount of money that they can spend at the cinemas. Uh, and so, you know... Absolutely. I've, I've really enjoyed having you on, man. Yeah, especially during like uh, Christmas time coming up because um, you know how uh, the end of the year is coming around? So a lot of movie reviewers are going to do their top 10 best list. And yeah. for- Do you have one planned? Absolutely. I'm going to do um, a top 10 best and a top 10 worst, but I'm not even That's sure if I'm going to do, do a yeah. top 10. 10 i think i might do a top 20 because there were so yeah. many great it's, movies it's a jam-packed year for absolutely. Yeah, absolutely i wasn't expecting this year to be that great because like mm-hmm. last year it was harder for me to make a top 10 because there weren't as much great movies last year but this year there's so many that i have to do yeah. probably like a top 20 and for absolutely. the top 10 worst this year, I gave myself a little bit back. I haven't seen that many bad movies, but they're – oh my gosh. Some of the bad movies, they were bad for yeah. sure. The, they always make a good top 10 list as well. You know, The worst they are for a, a top 10 worst, I mean it, it's not – You know, it's the opposite. You want them to be bad. You want them to be worse than they actually are, and if they are, then it's basically Christmas come early, right? I mean if they wanted to find uh, – the people that are listening to this uh, out there, uh, perhaps people who have only just learned – about what you do on YouTube over the course of this show. They wanted to find your channel uh, and, and particularly that video when it's when it comes up. Uh, where would they go? They would go, just go on YouTube.com and then just put it on the search engine, just put Alex Montez Reviews and you'll see my channel right there and all of my videos there. Mm-hmm. And I think you're you're pointing at the screen or something, right? That's your that's your uh, that's your display picture. Yeah, I'm like yeah. doing like a pose that I took with yeah. my thumbnails. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on the show, man. Uh, yeah. 
as Alex said, if you want to find his channel, you can go youtube.com. Then in a little search bar, you want to put Alex Montez Reviews, M-O-N-T-E-S. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, that's yep. the second spelling of your second name. Uh, Alex Montez Reviews. And you usually come up quite close to the top. The more words you put in, right? I mean, the, the more the more narrowed down the search will become. Yep. Uh, so thanks very much for listening, guys. Thanks, Alex, for being on the show. Please like, comment, subscribe, dislike. Um, all response is welcome. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>